So here's the deal. Uh, I was thinking yesterday as we were kind of talking through this, Brock, about how you try to change and reconfigure the Seahawks roster construction. Mm-hmm. I don't love the way their roster is constructed. I said it all last year. I've been saying it throughout this offseason. Like, I just don't like where their resources are. I think their best players, their most significant resources, and you could come up with some, some, you know, some uh, exceptions to this. But for the most part, this team is heavily invested on the outside, at corner, at receiver, at running back, even with a couple of second round picks. They've spent a lot of resources, whether it's money or draft capital, on guys who play really far away from the line of scrimmage. Well, safety number one. I mean, and that far outpacing everybody else in the league. Julian safety, Love. Safety. Three safeties. Quandre. Jamal. Yeah, They've invested line. heavily in three safeties. The After Geno, the next two most expensive players on their offense are Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf. Mm-hmm. They drafted two second-round running backs. They've spent a lot of capital mm-hmm. on positions that, to me, aren't as important. And so if I, if I look at the Seahawks and say, all right, if they want to make a change— if they want to try to build this roster differently, how do you go about doing that with the number 16 pick in the draft, no second round pick, and then a couple of third rounders? And oh, by the way, you have this looming question of do you want to try to get a quarterback? And Brock, you mentioning yesterday that the, the next year's draft is not going to be all that special. Mm-hmm. So you could be looking at a couple with more seasons. Yeah, quarterback. Yeah. At some point, especially in a draft that might have six first rounders akin to the 1983 quarterback draft. Yep. These are real conversations, but if you draft a quarterback at 16, there goes your opportunity to really improve offensive line, defensive line, edge, mm-hmm. linebacker. I mean, like all of these things that seem really crucial yep. to Mike McDonald's system. And so when you start thinking through and say, all right, how are you going to find a way to get better? How are you going to find a way to change? You don't do it by just giving up nothing. Mm -hmm. This is an argument that is somewhat akin to the trade Felix argument. Yep. But if you really do want to try to make a change in who you are, DK Metcalf is probably the asset you have that would bring back the most and allow you to change your lineup or your roster construction. Yeah. This is not a, yeah, everybody I don't sees like DK the, Yeah, Metcalf. everybody sees the column and, and, and the initial reactions. Like, oh, here's Salk again. Here's right. hot taker Salk. He's so negative. He hates DK Metcalf. Get rid of DK Metcalf. DK's too selfish. He's too individual, yada, yada, yada. And really what you're saying is he's your, golly, when you look at it, he... How many other valuable trade chips do you have? Essentially none. I mean, I, 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 a, a Woolen would be a valuable guy, but he's really, really young, and you get him, and you want him to bounce back anyway, and mm-hmm. he's much more valuable to you than he would be anybody else. I mean, you start to look at it, yeah, and it is probably DK. I mean, a, a Charles Cross would be another one. Again, but just I'm not a looking young, at trade guys on the line correct. of scrimmage. So, no. yeah, you know, when I see the the replies and the quote tweets and everything else that say things like, why are we talking about trading DK? He's the best player on the offense at the moment. I know. I know that. I, I totally understand. You think teams are lining up to get the seventh best player on your offense? Mm-mm. This isn't trading DK for a fifth round pick. It's not addition by subtraction. This is, if you want another first-round pick and more than that, this is how you go out and get it. A.J. Brown went for a first and a third. DK, in theory, should have a little bit more value because you've already paid him. So you're already eating the signing bonus, Mm -hmm. and the team that trades for him doesn't need to. Mm -hmm. So is DK worth two first-rounders? Is he worth what Jamal Adams was worth? Is he worth a first and a second? Is he worth, you know, there's a lot of conversations in there. If you got back a first and a second, and now, and a good first. Let's say you ended up with a ten or twelve pick in addition to your number sixteen pick, and mm-hmm. got back a second rounder and two third rounders. Mm-hmm. You can start to turn this team into something that resembles what Mike McDonald says he wants. Yes. So you guys read the column; it's at SeattleSports.com. If if you still disagree with me, that's totally fine. Mm-hmm. I don't mind. You can disagree with me on this all you want. I'll defend my point of view on it because to me it's an idea, it's a suggestion, it's one way to change a a roster that I think is constructed backwards. Mm. It's not the only way. There's plenty of other ways to do it. But I want to be clear, this is not an I hate DK Metcalf column. This is not a I don't think DK is good. This is sometimes you got to give up value to try mm. to make a change. And oh, by the way, there are there is a separate column to be written 
about whether or not DK is the right player to be spending that much money guaranteed on. Mm -hmm. Whether he is, based on some of the stuff that happened in the locker room and on the field last year, that guy. But this column is not about any of that. This is simply about value, roster construction, and trying to look for a new way of building this thing. And I, I, I will admit, last thing here, Brock, and then I'll let yeah. you kind of jump in. I'm sorry for kind of hogging this, but yeah. I wanted to wanted to explain myself. Part of the column is about the Chiefs. And part of it is about the team that just won the Super Bowl by by essentially, and we talked about this yesterday, investing in their quarterback and a tight end and their defense and ignoring essentially the wide receiver and running back position, especially in terms of money, resources. I think that's a pretty interesting way to look at a roster. Yes, I understand the major difference here being that they have a generational quarterback and the Seahawks currently have Geno Smith. But if you want to try to find a quarterback that is an upgrade on Geno Smith and still try to keep those other positions of need, line of scrimmage, linebacker, etc., if you still want to acquire both at the same time, This might be your only chance to do that. Yeah, and just the reality of the football player. We talked about this over the course of the season. I was just looking at at the year-end stats here. You know, the the guys at the very top, the elite receivers, the C.D. Lambs, the Tyreek Hills, the Amon Ross St. Brown has put himself in that class from a yardage and reception and production standpoint, Salk. You know what? They get completed to 70, 75, 73% of the time. Mm -hmm. Those targets are hit over 70% of the time. DK this year is 55%. I mean, that, that was that was less than Amari Cooper, who had five different quarterbacks in Cleveland. Now, some of that was Geno at times rushing and maybe not as accurate as he was the year before. Some of that is, you know, contested balls that he's not winning. There are things that DK does at a level that nobody else in the league can do. Pete has talked about this. When it comes to, like, power routes, when he's able to get going, when he's not pressed and he runs mm-hmm. a, a skinny post or he runs, you call that a bang eight or he a glance route or, or he runs a slant and, and, or he runs a go route. And, man, he just, you feel that just horsepower and strength that he has. But as a nimble little route runner, a little option route guy, uh, and in and out of the break with suddenness, and, you know, he's just, that that is not going to be the strength of, of his game. And... You know, what you want to build then becomes next question. You know, when you bring Ryan Grubb in the room and say, hey, Ryan, <laughs> you know, what What do you want? I think Ryan Grubb's going to say, I want a Roma Dunze. I actually want DK. You know, I, I'm, ne- I'm never going to have a 55% hit rate. This is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. I mean, this should be a 75, 70 and above. So we're going to find a way to, to, you know, craft all these one-on-ones. Or, you know what, Grubb's going to watch that one-on-one tape and go, man, you know, I think I think there's other opportunities here, boy, boys. And if you can get two ones, and you get two ones, you do this in a heartbeat. Absolutely. Period, and I don't know whether you can. I mean, that I is, don't think that's you, a, you probably cannot. And especially you the get a challenge. First and a second? Well, the other challenge and a third? is the market for receiver this yeah. year. Yep. This is a loaded receiver draft. But that is also part of my thinking is if you can find somebody that falls in love with the talent, falls in love with the size, falls in mm-hmm. love with that and thinks it's how they get themselves over the top. You can always kind of replenish your your wide receiver stock because there's a lot of really good wide receivers coming out of college every year. Yep. There aren't there is not enough great quarterbacks. There are not enough great offensive linemen or defensive linemen. Yep. I, like I don't know. Yeah. Yep. You guys can get upset. I, I totally understand. Are I pro- they upset? Are people upset? They are. Oh, <laughs> yes. You should read yes. through some of the replies, some of the okay. quote tweets. I've been ratioed for God's sakes, Brock. It's brutal. <laughs> I'm I'm just trying to live my life. I'm getting ratioed here.